This presentation uh, to illustrate the approach to the uh, jugular foramen surgically uh, includes a uh, case presentation of a left glomus jugulari tumor uh, with surgical uh, footage of the case itself as well as a cadaver dissection uh, demonstrating specific anatomical landmarks and approach uh, to the jugular foramen region. Surgical access to the jugular foramen is difficult because of its deep location and the surrounding neurovascular structures blocking its exposure, such as the internal carotid artery anteriorly, the facial nerve laterally, and the vertebral artery inferior to the posterior medial margin of the jugular foramen. Therefore, skull-based lesions of the jugular foramen should be approached as a surgical anatomist would to preserve the complex neurovascular structures of this region. Roten has categorized approaches to the jugular foramen into three groups. A lateral group directed through the mastoid bone, this would be the posterocular transtemporal approach. A posterior group directed through the posterior fossa, this would include a retrosigmoid or a more extensive far lateral or transcondylar variant approach. And finally, an anterior group of approaches directed through the tympanic bone. This would be the preauricular, subtemporal, infratemporal fossa approach or variations of that. In each of these approaches, a neck dissection can be included as needed to manage the specific pathology that one is dealing with. The goal of this video is to demonstrate the surgical anatomy of the postauricular transtemporal approach to the jugular foramen region. Combined with a neck dissection, this is the most common surgical approach chosen for management of lesions involving the jugular foramen. The labyrinth is usually preserved in this exposure, but depending on the pathology, the surgical field may be extended anteriorly by transposing the facial nerve and sacrificing the middle ear structures and external auditory canal, or medially by removal of the labyrinth or cochlea. We are viewing the inferior aspect of the right skull base in the region of the jugular foramen. The postauricular transtemporal approach, combined with a neck dissection, allows a 270 degree exposure of the jugular foramen at the skull base. This would include anteriorly exposing the internal carotid artery to the level of the carotid canal. Laterally, the styloid process and the facial nerve at the stylomastoid foramen. And posteriorly, the full extent of the rectus capitis lateralis muscles attachment to the posterior margin of the jugular foramen, which represents the jugular process of the occipital bone. Uh, the case that we're presenting for illustration of the technique is that of a 65-year-old lady who presented with pulsatile tinnitus, a normal lower cranial nerve and facial nerve function. Her hearing was also intact on the left side. Neurodiagnostic studies uh, included an MRI scan as well as CT scan revealing a 3-centimeter glomus jugulari tumor with destruction of the uh, uh, mastoid uh, bone primarily. Uh, and the region of the jugular bulb by the glomus jugulari tumor. The cerebral angiogram on this uh, individual uh, demonstrated significant blood supply from both the left external and vertebral arteries, uh, typical of a glomus jugulari tumor. There was no uh, blood supply to the tumor from the internal carotid artery at the skull base. Uh, preoperatively, the patient uh, underwent embolization the day prior to surgery. The patient was placed in a supine position with an ipsilateral shoulder roll and the head turned away from the surgeon. The postauricular area is exposed through a large C-shaped incision. Our cadaver dissection begins with the sharp dissection of the sternocleidal mastoid muscle from the mastoid tip. The sternocleidomastoid muscle is uh, carefully mobilized posteriorly. Uh, care is taken to preserve the uh, accessory cranial nerve, uh, which enters the posterior medial aspect of the superior sternocleidomastoid muscle at the level of the tip 
of the seaborne transverse process. This rodent dissection uh, shows the uh, relationship of the anatomy of the sternocleidomastoid muscle to the posterior belly of the digastric, facial nerve, and styloid process. Uh, these uh, anatomical structures are viewed uh, clearly in this uh, particular dissection because the parotid gland has been removed. A specific anatomy uh, to be noted uh, in this view is the facial nerve exiting the stylomastoid foramen immediately anterior to the posterior belly of the digastric attached to the digastric groove. Also note the styloid process uh, can be seen clearly uh, and the facial nerve uh, exiting in the stylomastoid foramen along the posterior lateral margin of the styloid process. Note also uh, in this view the accessory nerve crossing the anterior margin of the jugular vein to enter the posterior medial aspect of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The posterior belly of the digastric uh, has been mobilized uh, with a right angle and uh, isolated uh, with application of a vascular loop. The posterior belly of the digastric muscle is sharply dissected from the digastric groove of the mastoid tip and mobilized inferiorly. Removal of the uh, posterior belly of the digastric muscle from the digastric groove allows exposure of the facial nerve at the stylomastoid foramen. This also allows palpation of the styloid process and the three small muscles attached to the process. The stylomastoid foramen is found at the posterior lateral margin of the styloid process base. The parotid gland must be mobilized anteriorly to expose the facial nerve at the stylomastoid foramen. In this view, the stylohyoid muscle has been retracted to expose the styloid process. The muscles attached to the styloid process are sharply dissected. Here the uh, stylohyoid muscle is being uh, reflected uh, inferiorly along with the uh, posterior belly of the digastric muscle. The soft tissue is carefully dissected to uh, expose the facial nerve as it enters the stylomastoid foramen uh, along the posterior lateral aspect of the styloid base. The styloid base can be palpated anteriorly and posterior to the facial nerve as it enters the stylomastoid foramen. We also see the facial nerve entering the posterior aspect of the parotid gland, which has been partially removed for exposure. If the parotid gland uh, is entered, uh, it is important to close the capsule of the parotid uh, with interrupted vicryl suture. Uh, this uh, will help to prevent uh, a postoperative seroma. Here one sees the stylomastoid artery, uh, which typically arises from the posterior auricular artery. Now the stylomastoid artery should be preserved because of its uh, blood supply to the uh, mastoid segment of the facial nerve. Here the facial nerve is retracted anteriorly to uh, expose the extent of the styloid process. Removal of the styloid process is necessary to expose the internal carotid artery immediately below the skull base. This should be done when the internal carotid artery is encased by the tumor or provides an arterial blood supply to the tumor. The internal carotid artery was not involved by the tumor in the case that we're presenting today, therefore this step was not necessary. The styloid process is removed with a rongeur.
Attention is turned to the lower neck to expose the jugular vein and the common carotid artery. Removal of the facial vein allows exposure of the carotid bifurcation. The hyperglossal nerve is identified typically at the level of the bifurcation or immediately above the bifurcation as it courses medially to the base of the tongue. It is noted that the accessory nerve can typically be found at the level of the tip of the transverse process of C1. The accessory nerve can pass either anterior or posterior to the jugular vein at this level. The occipital artery is mobilized and removed in order to gain exposure of the upper cervical region. The jugular vein is mobilized superiorly, exposing the carotid bifurcation, the vagal, and the hypoglossal nerves. The superior thyroid artery is seen at the base of the external carotid artery. The external carotid artery is retracted to allow exposure of the internal carotid artery. The internal carotid artery is exposed immediately below the skull base. The ninth cranial nerve can be seen at this level crossing the anterior margin of the internal carotid artery. In this view, one can see the ninth cranial nerve exiting the medial aspect of the jugular foramen. This view also shows the fusion of the hypoglossal and the tenth cranial nerves as they approach the jugular foramen. The fusion of the uh, lower cranial nerves uh, can occur immediately below the skull base as they approach the jugular foramen. This may be true of any combination of the 10th, 11th, or 12th cranial nerves. In this extended uh, dissection view of the high cervical area, uh, following the removal of the sternocleidomastoid, posterior belly of the digastric muscles, uh, one clearly sees the uh, ninth cranial nerve crossing along the anterior margin of the high internal carotid artery. The hypoglossal nerve uh, is uh, seen coursing immediately above the level of the uh, carotid bifurcation as it uh, travels immediately towards the base of the tongue. The 11th cranial nerve is seen crossing the anterior margin of the uh, jugular vein uh, in the high cervical area at the posterior margin of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, uh, which has been uh, resected. Finally, one sees the uh, vagal nerve uh, as it courses uh, between the uh, internal carotid artery and the jugular vein. Uh, attention is turned at this stage of the procedure to the mastoidectomy. The anatomical landmarks to be identified include the supramastoid crest, uh, superiorly, Posteriorly, the asterion, uh, which provides localization of the junction of the transverse sigmoid sinus and exposure of the sigmoid sinus. Anteriorly, the spine of Henley should be noted uh, to provide the location of the lateral semicircular canal. As the mastoidectomy proceeds, uh, it is noted that uh, there's a small mastoid air cell space in this specimen. It's very important that uh, uh, exposure is uh, wide to include the transverse and sigmoid sinus to the level of the jugular bulb. Uh, this requires uh, exposure of dura uh, posterior to the sigmoid sinus as well as in the pre-sigmoid space. Uh, the antrum uh, has been exposed in the mastoidectomy. Uh, noted in this specimen is a high jugular bulb, uh, which uh, uh, is important to recognize because of its relationship to the facial nerve as well as the internal carotid artery anteriorly. The mastoid segment of the facial nerve is skeletonized. 
Here we're drilling along the posterior semicircular canal. The corda tympani uh, is identified. One now sees the facial recess defined uh, between the superior aspect of the mastoid segment of the facial nerve and the corda tympani. Uh, drilling through the facial recess opens the middle ear space. The superior aspect of the mastoid segment of the facial nerve can be seen turning uh, below the lateral semicircular canal anteriorly. Uh, the superior semicircular canal is further uh, defined. After ligation and division, the jugular vein must be mobilized to the level of the skull base in order to have full exposure of the jugular foramen. The 11th cranial nerve is found at the level of the tip of the transverse process of C1. If the 11th cranial nerve passes over the anterior margin of the jugular vein, as in this case, the jugular vein must be transposed anteriorly to allow dissection of the jugular vein to the level of the jugular foramen. The rectus capitis lateralis muscle is dissected from the posterior margin of the jugular vein. Uh, this rotund dissection uh, shows the relationship of the rectus capitis lateralis muscle as it arises from the superior surface of the transverse process of C1 to project superiorly attaching to the posterior bony margin of the jugular foramen. The vertebral artery surrounded by its venous plexus exits the foramen transverse serum immediately posterior medial to the rectus capitis lateralis muscle. The transverse process of C1 is defined. This muscle is sharply dissected from the superior margin of the transverse process of C1 and then removed in a piecemeal fashion to the posterior margin of the jugular foramen. Removal of the rectus capitis lateralis muscle is necessary in order to expose the posterior margin of the jugular foramen. As one removes the rectus capitis lateralis muscle, one must be careful to avoid the vertebral artery which exits the foramen transverse serum posterior medial to the rectus capitis lateralis muscle. Here we see the venous plexus associated with the vertebral artery. The lower cranial nerves are separated from the jugular vein to the level of the jugular foramen Residual bone and the fibrous ring of the jugular foramen are removed. The jugular vein uh, is opened uh, through the jugular foramen into the jugular bulb area. Followed by removal of the lateral wall of the sigmoid sinus. In an actual case where a tumor would involve the jugular foramen or jugular bulb region, one must uh, isolate this region initially by ligating the jugular vein immediately below the skull base, followed by ligation of the sigmoid sinus distal to the junction of the transverse sigmoid sinus and the entry of the superior petrosal sinus into that junction. This isolation of the sigmoid sinus and jugular bulb region by ligation of the respective venous structures is very important in order to preserve the superior petrosal sinus and avoid a potential thrombosis of the vena labae. The technique of ligation of the sigmoid sinus uh, involves uh, individual uh, foral silk sutures that are passed from the outer wall of the sinus uh, 
attaching it to the inner wall of the sinus. And this is done in a serial fashion to cause occlusion of the sinus. In order to prevent bleeding uh, during this procedure, the proximal portion of the sinus can be occluded by using bone wax packed underneath the uh, edge of bone extending over the junction of the transverse sigmoid sinus. Uh, the uh, reason that uh, the technique of uh, placing individual sutures uh, uh, to ligate the sigmoid sinus, as I've described, is to prevent opening the posterior fossa dura uh, and uh, with the potential of having a, a cerebral spinal fluid leakage uh, from opening the dura. Uh, you must remember that in this case, as in uh, a significant number of glomastigularia tumor cases, this tumor is an extradural tumor, and uh, the posterior fossa is not violated unless the tumor has significant extension into the posterior fossa, which uh, in this day is uh, really quite uncommon because most of these tumors are identified uh, when they're uh, typically uh, medium size or smaller tumors. In this specimen, the contents of the sigmoid sinus, jugular bulb, and jugular vein are removed. The last portion of the latex material removed is from the condylar emissary vein coming into the posterior margin of the jugular uh, bulb region. Exposure of the uh, medial wall of the jugular bulb reveals the multiple venous channels representing the inferior petrosal sinus drainage. One also notes the condylar emissary vein immediately inferior. In removing tumors involving the jugular foramen or jugular bulb region, it is very important to leave the medial wall of the jugular bulb intact to protect the lower cranial nerves. Once we have ligated the sigmoid sinus, the next stage of the operative procedure is to approach the tumor uh, which in this case is primarily involving the mastoid bone and the region of the jugular bulb. Uh, the labyrinth uh, as well as the cochlea uh, are not involved with tumor, nor is the middle ear invaded by the tumor mass. At this level, we're removing a tumor involving the mastoid bone uh, the bleeding that uh, one sees is uh, obviously significantly reduced because of the preoperative embolization, but bleeding that is encountered should be controlled with either application of bone wax, cotinoid pledgets, or surgicil. Uh, until the anatomy is defined, uh, we tend to uh, avoid using bipolar cautery because the majority of the bleeding that is encountered is actually venous uh, as opposed to arterial. At this stage of the operative procedure, you uh, see the uh, jugular vein containing a tumor which has been ligated uh, at the level of the uh, transverse process of C1, roughly. Uh, the dissection is carried along the posterior margin of the jugular foramen uh, to uh, the level of the fibrous ring. Uh, as we dissect uh, along the posterior margin of the jugular vein to the level of the fibrous ring, we encounter uh, uh, significant arterial vessels which have been embolized. This represents the ascending pharyngeal uh, artery, uh, which is a significant blood supply uh, to the glomus jugulari tumor. Here we're mobilizing and uh, cutting the fibrous ring to open the uh, jugular foramen along the lateral and posterior margin. At this stage, we're opening the jugular vein, uh, which uh, you can see uh, is filled with a glomus a tumor, uh, which is typical of this particular pathology. As you recall, glomus jugulari tumors typically arise at the dome of the jugular bulb and can be found both extra as well as intraluminal. Uh, this is the case uh, in this particular situation where tumor fills not only the jugular vein extending below the skull base, but completely fills that region of the jugular bulb with invasion of the uh, mastoid bone uh, at, uh, at the level uh, primarily below uh, 
uh, the uh, labyrinth as well as the uh, middle ear space and cochlea. As the uh, vein is opened, uh, one sees the uh, typical appearance of the glomus jugulari tumor, which, uh, because of its embolization, appears uh, almost avascular. Uh, the tumor is removed in a piecemeal fashion, extending up into the region of the bulb. As the tumor is removed at the uh, bulb level, uh, there is attachment of the tumor primarily at the region of the dome of the jugular bulb, uh, as well as partially on the medial wall superiorly uh, in that region. The bone uh, involvement above the level of the bulb and below the labyrinth uh, is carefully removed following definition of that tumor that has been removed uh, from the bulb as well as the uh, jugular vein itself. Uh, the tumor has been removed and the tumor bed is packed with surgicil for hemostasis. Uh, this rodent dissection in a, a normal specimen shows the medial wall of the jugular foramen and bulb region and the lower cranial nerves that are covered by the medial wall with the uh, various venous channels that represent the inferior petrosa sinus and condylar emissary drainage into the jugular bulb. Closure of the cranial defect is accomplished by utilizing a fat graft taken from the anterior abdomen. The graft is held firmly in place by a titanium mesh cranioplasty which closes the cranial defect. The sternocleidomastoid muscle can be attached to the titanium mesh and the soft tissue of the neck dissection closed in a layered fashion. Post off the patient's hearing, lower cranial nerve, and facial function were normal. Her pulsatile tinnitus was no longer present. A two month post op follow up MRI scan of her head showed no residual glomus tumor. Benign tumors are the most common pathology affecting the jugular foramen region. The majority are chemodectomas, neurolomomas, or meningiomas. Rarely, chordomers or chondrosarcomas may involve the jugular foramen as well as other malignant tumors. The type of pathology and the extent to which it involves the neurovascular structures of the jugular foramen region will determine the selection of an approach to the jugular foramen. A preauricular subtemporal infratemporal approach will be necessary for management of tumors involving the internal carotid artery and the anterior jugular foramen. The retrosigmoid approach involving a far lateral transchondral exposure is needed for jugular foramen tumors occupying the posterior fossa or foramen magnum. Our presentation is focused on the most common approach to the jugular foramen, the postauricular transtemporal approach combined with a neck dissection. This presentation has emphasized a thorough understanding of the surgical anatomy of the jugular foramen region and the carotid space. The concept of exposing the jugular foramen below the skull base in a 270 degree fashion has been shown in a stepwise fashion. Skull base lesions of the jugular foramen should be approached as a surgical anatomist to preserve the complex neurovascular structures of this region and improve one's surgical outcome. For further study of this region in order to understand this complex anatomy, please uh, review Dr. Roten's lecture on the jugular foramen.